we're going to we're going to round up today with um, uh, my friend. He's become my friend over the years, and I'm I'm no longer there. We go. So Mark Hunter is is uh, is a guy that you know. It, my staff said he's a keeper today. So you obviously impressed the staff. So Mark has written a few books, and he's known for his high profit prospecting and many other things. But uh, I love it because he's got this great announcing voice, and his nickname is The Sales Hunter. And Mark is a good friend and a good friend of UTD. We're glad he's in town, and I'll turn the time over to Mark. Thank you. And my, my objective is to disrupt your thinking. I'm going to disrupt your thinking. I'm going to disrupt your thinking. I'm going to disrupt your thinking. And I'm going to start by taking everything we've been talking about here this morning and this afternoon. I mean, I heard some words that kind of spun my head around. First of all, I heard the word trust. Now, I love the word trust. Trust is key in sales. But I also heard a lot of other things, like sales is dying and some other things that nobody wants to be talked to on the telephone. Excuse me, sales is a beautiful profession. It is beautiful, it is outstanding. And I'll tell you what, we saw a lot of statistics. Here's the only statistic I'm taking away from here. And that was what David Hood, CEO of Vanilla Soft shared. Remember that dog statistic? You know, 33% of all households have dogs, yet he went around the table and only 25% had, well, what? see, statistics, never really matter because it's a conversation between two people. That's what sales is all about. Sales is about people talking to people. And I'll tell you what, I am passionate about sales. I've had the privilege to write a couple books and, and we're gonna talk about one in particular, high profit prospecting. And you're probably thinking, wow, this guy is, he's born to sell. Let me tell you something. I made the upper half of my class possible in college. There was no UTD sales when I was in school back in the 1800s. There was nothing like that. My job was, I, I was getting a degree in marketing. That was, that was going to be my job. Really, I wanted to be a disc jockey. You're listening to the Mighty 95 KQZ Radio, 719 in the city. But no, you can't tell your parents that. It's where tuition money went. No. So I, I got a degree in marketing, and I was all set to go into marketing because my job, my future was going to be writing really lousy furniture commercials for the radio. You know, that was going to be my job. And I was all set, and I graduated. Well, a little problem was about eight or 10 weeks before that, I kept running into some people. And these people changed my career. They changed my career. The people who changed my career, the Seattle Police Department. <laughs> the Seattle Police Department changed my career. Now, what happened was I got four speeding tickets. Really, only three. One was a double ticket. I didn't know you need to ride on, drive on the right-hand side of the road. I didn't know that was really a problem. I got four. Now, nobody was hurt. Nobody was injured. No, it's okay. But hey, being in college, you're not responsible for your actions, right? Now, I, I, hey, I paid the tickets, and it was fine. Everything was cool. I was well on my way to getting my job in marketing, and then I got this letter from my insurance company. Very personable letter. Very personal, kind of one-to-one -one marketing, one-to-one -one selling. Now, they weren't canceling my insurance. They were just inviting me into a high-risk pool. <laughs> Problem was, I was no longer on the company payroll. In other words, <laughs> mom and dad weren't liking me. <laughs> I was gone, I was, I was great, hey, you're, you're graduate, you take care of that problem. So I was left with really, a, really a, a problem. I couldn't afford the car I was driving. That is how I wound up in sales. I got a job that supplied me with a company car. It was a sales job. And you know what? I was a master at sales, I was good. Because I viewed every customer I met as an ATM, always taking more. And you know what? It wasn't long before I got fired from that first sales job. I got fired from that first sales job. And then, so I, I did what I had to do. I had to go get a second sales job. I went and got a second sales job. Got fired from that job too. This is great. You're listening to a guy who's been fired from two sales jobs. Yeah, yeah. Here was the problem. See, I was looking at sales totally wrong. I was looking at sales as a transaction. Sales is not a transaction. 
Sales is about people communicating with people. You see, when we prospect with integrity, we will get customers who have integrity. And I want you to think about that. One of the issues I think the sales profession has is because there's a lot of garbage out there. But I look at sales as an extremely noble profession. And it's amazing how you become who you associate with, right? Remember as a kid, your parents always said, don't hang out with them. How come all my friends were saying that their parents said that they shouldn't hang out with me? I, I, I don't know. I, anyway, anyway. Some of you got that, most of you did not. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Different times though. It's okay, it's okay, late in the afternoon. And, and here, here's the whole thing. See, it comes down to we get really the type of person, as a customer, as the type of person we are. And, and see, my whole objective is I want to earn the right, the privilege, honor, and respect to be able to meet with that person again. Every time I meet with somebody, I want to earn the right, the privilege, honor, and respect to be able to meet with that person again. That's what sales is all about. You see, here's the mark of a good sales organization. The mark of a good sales organization is what percentage of your sales is coming from at either repeat sales, referral sales, connection sales, something like that. Because if that is on a trend line up long term, that means you're doing something right. You know, it's also the mark of a good place to go to work. Because think about this. Think about this. We have a lot of students here in the room. Ask yourself this question, where are companies sourcing their people? Because if companies are not sourcing their people because of leads, because of, of people who currently work there or used to work there, or connections, then it must not be a good place to work. You see, it's amazing. You see, it becomes who you want to be hanging out with. My objective is one thing. I want to influence and impact each person I meet every day. Make that your goal. When you wake up in the morning, your goal is to influence and impact. It's amazing how it changes your whole perspective with regards to sales. You see, sales leadership is about helping others see and achieve what they did not think was possible. That's what sales is all about. Sales is about helping others see and achieve. See, this whole concept of, oh no, people don't want to be, don't want to, no, you can't, you can't call them, you can't. The only people who don't want to use the telephone are the people who are afraid to pick up the telephone. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. You see, the telephone works, and it works wonderfully, because it's about a conversation. It's people connecting with people. Now, let's take a step back, and let's look at this. Sales is, you know, it's about helping others see and achieve. And let me tell you something. If we wait for the phone to ring, if we only do marketing, if we only do that, I'm going to tell you a little story about my daughter. My daughter lives right up the road here, about four miles up the road here. And she had some new people who moved into her neighborhood. She didn't know them. They'd only lived there a couple months. She hadn't had a chance to meet them. She looks outside her window one night, and their house is on fire. Their house is on fire. Oh, I don't know them. Maybe I'll connect with them on Facebook. Maybe I'll send them an Instagram. I'll just wait for something. No. What did she do? She's a nurse. She immediately went immediately over to that house to make sure that they were out of that house. You see, because she had the ability, so it's her responsibility to get in touch with those people. You see, if we wait for people to pick up the phone and call us, remember, some of you are old enough to know when Steve Jobs first came out with the iPhone. Did you know that you needed a, a, a camera, a computer, uh, a recording device, and all that in a telephone? I didn't know that. <laughs> see, if I had waited, I knew that, I'd still have a flip phone. <laughs> Steve Jobs was selling. Steve Jobs was selling. You see, I got to stop and ask myself this question. Who am I selling to? Every day I'm selling. Let me walk you through. You know who this is? General Dwight D. Eisenhower, President of the United States. Now, you go back to World War II, and, and he was in charge of Operation Overlord. Operation Overlord was a key battle in World War II in Europe. Today it's known as the Battle of Normandy. And the night before, and he had to make a critical decision. Weather was bad, do we proceed or do we not? He proceeded. Every troop going into battle received a letter from him. Every troop talking about what they were about to face. 
and that many of them may not make it home. Was he selling or was he leading? He was doing both. Winston Churchill at the same time, Prime Minister, United Kingdom. When he took to the radio airwaves every day for the citizens of London to tell them to fear not because of the bombs that were falling from Germany. Was he selling or was he leading? You see, sales is leadership. Leadership is sales. And when we prospect, we're helping people to begin that journey. See, I use the word prospect. I don't use the word sales. I use the word prospect for a very simple reason. Because sales too much is like, well, I'll just sit back and wait for the order to come. That's called customer service. <laughs> sales is about creating incremental opportunities. I want you to stop and think about that. Sales is about creating incremental. That's what your goal is. Incremental opportunities. You see, sales is leadership. Leadership is sales. Are you practicing that? Are you doing that? That's what you're doing every day. Now, your greatest asset is your time. And I, I want you to really put a perspective on what we mean by that. You see, the greatest asset is not your what you sell. I could care less what you sell. I really could care less what you sell. You know what's interesting? A few months ago, I was out in New Jersey, in not a great part of New Jersey, going door to door with a salesperson from Comcast. We were selling cable services. Comcast. Now, that doesn't exactly have a great reputation, right? We were having a kick. We were having fun. We're out there going door to door selling cable services. You see, because he looked at it, you know what I'm doing? I'm providing these people the ability to have fun, to get their entertainment. You see, it's not what we sell, it's the outcomes we create. That's what you want to focus in on. Focus in on the outcomes you create. I'm going to challenge you. Write down, take a piece of paper, write down what are all the outcomes that you create? What are all the outcomes that you've helped your customers create? And when you write down that list, go, mm -hmm, I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. Yeah, that's what you do. Whenever you're thinking, I can't make one more call, I can't make one more call, look at that list and go, oh, yeah, I can. See, because your greatest asset is your time. I want to challenge you. You know the measurement of time that you need to do? It's called CFT. CFT, write this down. Customer facing time. That's the metric I want you to measure. Customer facing time. How much customer facing time? You see, here's what I see. I, I see too many salespeople, and this is, oh, I'm going to get wound up on this one if I'm not wound up already. People get hung up in their sales stack. Well, we got this tool, this tool, this tool. That's a lot of crap being created to solve problems that don't exist. And they get caught up in all these different things I got to do. I got to update this, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. You see, the metric that counts is how much of my time is spent face-to-face -face with customers. Now, face-to-face -face with customers might be interacting by way of text, it might be email, it might be telephone, it might be Zoom, it might be go to meeting, it might be in person, I don't care. But that's the measurement. Because you know what? When I'm doing that, I'm doing what no technology can do. I'm interacting human to human. And I really believe in this overstressed out world that we live in. People are craving genuine relationships. Genuine relationships. You can be a genuine relationship to somebody in sales. Don't think that you can't. The mark of an impact that I love to use is, how many of you have ever been to Chick-fil-A? Right? Right? Okay. Hey, most people are into Chick-fil-A. You walk into Chick-fil-A, you can't help but act different, right? Because <laughs> you walk out going, my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, you do, right? See, what is it? Because those people that work at Chick-fil-A impact you. You impact each person you meet. That's why I say you get to earn the right, the privilege, honor, respect, to be able to meet with that person again. You see, this is, this is what a lot of people's sales pipelines look like. Whoa, look at that one on the left. It's a sewer line. It's plugged up because you've got a lot of gunk in the middle. See, what I want to have is I want to have a prospecting funnel, pipeline, whatever you want to call it, 
on the right. It's more like a water tap. I want to, I want to bring you in and just move you through quickly. But see, here's what happens. See, what happens is we have people over on the left-hand side, and it's a sewer pipe, and, and they're stuck right in the middle of the sales process because we're not willing to ask the tough question. It's easier to keep them in the pipeline because then we can go to our boss and, oh, yeah, they're in my pipeline, they're in my pipeline. Hey, I used to have a boss like that, and, and, and I always knew, as long as I kept a lot of stuff in the pipeline, even though it wasn't moving, he'd stay off my case. Yeah, yeah, that's a big problem. What I want to do is I want to have it be moving through. You see, what I, I see, I, the era of the wide funnel, the, the era of the wide funnel is gone. Let's get rid of the wide funnel. What I want to have is I want to have a narrow funnel. I want to have a very narrow funnel. Why do I want to have a narrow funnel? Because I'm going to move you through quickly. And you know what's interesting? When I, when I have a narrow funnel, I, I actually create more value for you. I create more value. And you know what's very interesting? The customer perceives the outcome they're going to get based off the sales process used to get them. So when I have a really cool sales process, when I'm interacting with you and you think I'm beautiful, and I think, you know, I think, I'm, no, no. It, 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 it's, when, I'm, when I put the focus on you, it's amazing how you feel I look good. I can't take a Walmart shopper and turn them into a Nordstrom customer. Think about this for a moment. How many of you ever been into a Walmart? Ever been into a Walmart? Yeah. How many of you ever been into a Nordstrom? They're completely different. Look, they're completely different. You see, and what's very interesting is, is I can't take a Walmart shopper, and, and this, is, this is why we get into discounting. Because, because what happens is we have somebody who, who, they're this Walmart shopper, and they suddenly walk into Nordstrom, and, and they go, well, that price is too, well, okay, I'll cut the price, I'll cut the price, I'll cut the price. You're prospecting the wrong person. Your prospect, do you know what your ICP is? Your ideal customer profile is. Figure it out and stick to that lane. This again is the narrow funnel. I want to have a very narrow funnel. See, because here's the thing, low trust is low price. If I have this wide funnel, I, I, I don't know you. I can't figure out what you are. And you know what? <laughs> the lower the level of trust, the lower the price. You see, trust is currency. Trust is currency. Trust is at the core of business. Look at any high margin company, any high profit company. They have, have developed high trust with their customers. Ask yourself this question, what am I doing to get to know trust? Well, let's go ahead and dig into some of this. It's about C plus C equals C equals O equals P. And I told you I made the upper half of my class possible. It's not that complicated. <laughs> what it comes down to is very simply this. First C is continuity. Continuity. They've got to see you enough. They've got to see you enough. And oh, by the way, let's talk about this from a pure prospecting standpoint. I may have to call you five times. I may have to call you 10 times. I may have to call you 15 times. But as I just put, oh, well, it'll be on my blog post tomorrow. You cannot email or call up a customer and say, I'm just checking in. Checking in is what you do at a hotel. It's not what you do with a prospect. Every time I reach out to a customer, every time I reach out to a prospect, I want to bring new value. I want to bring new value. I just posted a video yesterday on my YouTube channel. Go out and watch it. I walked through about eight different things there. Yeah. You see what it is? It, it's I create continuity. And you know what's interesting? As I create continuity, I create competence. Because now you begin to realize, this guy's actually pretty smart. This guy's actually pretty smart. You see, what's interesting is when I'm bringing you information that you can dig into, that you can like, that you can relate to, when I'm, when I'm asking you questions based on things that you've shared with me in a previous conversation, when, when I, you got to move your leg because I can't see the clock. Thank you. There, I can see the clock. Now, now I can watch my countdown. Okay. <laughs> Funny, I kept looking where you move your... Yeah. And, did I tell you I'm ADD? Did I tell you I drink a lot of coffee? Yes, I do. It's okay. It doesn't show, does it? No, no, it's okay. No. And, and, and here's the whole thing. See, when I take something that you shared with me, maybe I talked to you two months ago, and we haven't connected, but I finally get you on the phone. I say, hey, Robert, when we talked a couple months ago, you mentioned this. What's Robert going to suddenly think? Wow. That salesperson actually remembered. That salesperson actually cared. What am I doing? I'm creating confidence. See, what's very interesting 
Confidence is the outcome of continuity and competence. And when I create continuity and competence, I create confidence. Now here's where a lot of salespeople go wonky. They get somebody on the phone or an email and the, and the customer goes, or the prospect goes, just give me your price. Okay, so I give him the price. Loser! <laughs> just because somebody asks for the price. See, see, here's the problem. You do this because that's great customer service. That's what your mom told you. Your mom told you when somebody, when somebody asks you a question, you're supposed to answer it, right? Right, right? That, that's what you were told, right? No! Your mom's not with you. You never put a price on the table until you fully understand what the opportunity is. What is the opportunity? What is the need? What's the pain? What's the gain? What's the, what's the thing I'm going to help you with? What, what is one of those outcomes that I'm going to be able to help you with that I've helped other customers with? I can't put a price. I was coaching a gentleman yesterday on the phone. He said, Mark, I, I get customers all the time. And, and he, he says, they, they always ask me what the price is. And I go, well, here's your answer. He says, well, you know what? I'd hate to give you a price because you might wind up buying something that you don't need. Ooh, he said, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> because now, so, so what, what you're doing is you're just, I, I want to ask you some questions so I can make sure I give you the right opportunity, the right, yeah. And I dialogue. I don't care what it is. You dialogue with the customer. The customer calls you up and they want the fast price. I'll give you the fast price. It's usually about a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, usually about a million dollars. I'm going to share you a quick story about price because price gets you into trouble. And this is where the C plus C comes into play. I, I got off an airplane, called my assistant. She said, Mark, by the way, so-and-so is going to call you in just a few minutes. CEO of a company wants you to come in and keynote. At their, at their sales kickoff meeting. I go, that's great, great. But I think he's concerned about your price. I said, great, fine, bring him on. So I know more than get back to my office, and, and he calls and calls me up, goes, Mark, your fee is way too high. You're going to have to cut your fee. No, I can't cut my fee. I can cut my value. Oh, by the way, how big of a competitive threat is this new player going to be in your business next year? That's exactly what I said. That's exactly what I said. Pause, and he said, that was good. <laughs> I asked you to cut your fee, and you got me thinking about my biggest problem. It's because I knew what their opportunity was. They had a new competitor coming into the marketplace. See, we didn't put a price on the table until we knew what the opportunity was. So then he says, that was good. You're hired. You're hired. Then he goes on to say, so anyway, we talked for a few minutes. Then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, you weren't my first choice. I go, yeah, that makes me feel real good. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you weren't my first choice. There was somebody else I really wanted to get, and I called them. And before I had him off the phone, he had cut his price in half. Then I thought to myself, is that the person I want standing in front of my sales force? No. What's the outcome your customers are looking for? Your customers will pay any price if you provide them enough value, enough outcome. And see, that's the P, profit. Profit is a beautiful word. Profit is wonderful. What does profit allow? Profit allows me to do my business better so I can invest more in you. Profit, profit is wonderful because guess what? The higher the profit for me, the more the value you're going to perceive because it goes two ways. Trust me. It's amazing. I firmly, I don't have any, st oh, I could say it. We've heard enough data here. I could go ahead and make it up. I truly believe that more discounts are given because the salesperson doesn't believe in the price than is given because of the demands of the customer. 
Because the salesperson just says, oh, your price is due. Okay, 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 oh, I just reduced my price. Oh, man, I wish I had two hours so we could go into that. See, here's the key to prospecting. It's in the bottle of shampoo in your shower. A couple of key words, every bottle. Now, most of you look at a bottle of shampoo. For you of you, don't. It's okay. It's okay. okay. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. Okay, back off. <laughs> There's a couple of key, hey, you know what? Hey, it saves you money, right? Right, saves you money, right? Right, okay. There's a couple of key words there, rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. What does rinse and repeat have to do with prospecting? Everything. Because you know what rinse is all about? It doesn't say rinse the old shampoo out of your hair and then put the same shampoo back in your hair. No, it's different shampoo. Every time I call the prospect, I'm bringing them a different piece of information. But I gotta repeat. I gotta repeat. You see, I may have to go through that C plus C, half a dozen, a dozen. I may have to go through it 15, 20 times. Now, what is the right number? It's gonna depend on what you sell, who you sell to, the frequency with which they purchase, and a whole host of other things. But here's, here's, the, here's the simple measurement that I use. Whatever you think it is, double it. Double it. More sales are lost because salespeople just give up. Well, I called them three times. I don't think they're interested. No, you're lazy. You're lazy. Again, you have the ability, it's your responsibility. They did not wake up, you, your prospects did not wake up this morning thinking, wow, I hope, what's your first name? Edo. What was that? Edo. I hope Edo calls me today. No, nobody did that. I don't even think your mother did, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe your mother loves you. <laughs> You're gonna like, so you're, I got, I got, okay, I'll give you a book when I get done, okay? okay? Yeah. You see, people didn't wake up saying, I hope Edo calls me today. It's Edo's responsibility to call them. It's your responsibility to reach out. Okay, so let's talk about what are some questions that we can use to accelerate prospecting? Because here's what it is. It's not about, wow, Alex, priceless. Alex, are you still in the room? Yeah, Al. No, Alex, AT&T. Did he leave? He left. Great, great, he left. Here I am talking about him and he left the building. How he said that the program had not changed in seven years, they were still talking about Alexander Graham Bell. Whoa. <laughs> Your prospects don't want to hear a capabilities presentation. They don't want to hear it. They want a capabilities presentation, they'll go on the internet. But they want to have us questions. See, what I want to do is I want to ask questions. I, I want to treat you as if you're a bobblehead doll. I want to treat you as if you're a bobblehead doll. My objective is to get you on the phone and just tap that little head and get that head moving. And so what, what is it? I, uh, it's about micro commitments. You see, when I make a prospecting call to you, I, come on, people. It's not about trying to close the sale unless you're in a really short sales cycle. It's just about moving the ball forward. It's, it's just about earning enough trust and, and enough confidence and enough competence to be able to get, yeah. So all I'm doing is I, I'm just asking you a micro commitment. My goal is to get you to agree to probably a scheduled time where we can have a call. That, that's really what it's about. Now, how do I go about doing that? I'm going about doing that by really trying to uncover from you proprietary information. What is proprietary? This is a measurement that I love to use because you know what this tells me? This tells me that I've connected with you. When you share with me something not known publicly, boom, I got you. In a good sense, because it means there's a level of trust. My questions are all about just connecting. Now, have you noticed something? As I've been talking to you, my voice goes up, my voice goes down, my voice goes all over the place. What does it do? It pulls you in. But it also begins to get you to connect with me on a personal level. Your personality comes through on the phone much more than you realize. You see, great questions come from asking outcome-focused questions. So I might ask them a question that's going to be relative. Say, hey, other people are seeing this happen. What are you seeing happening in your marketplace? I'm just getting them talking. And whatever they share with me, I ask them a follow-up question about it. Whatever they share. Whatever they say, you ask them a follow-up question about it. Because now it says like, wow, he or she is actually listening. It's not a robot just going through this list of 25 questions. You see, your goal is to qualify fast to allow you to spend more time with fewer prospects. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, you see, I don't want this wide funnel. I want this narrow. I, I want to be able to have fewer prospects that I can spend more time with. Because when I can spend more time with you, 
I'm going to be able to understand your needs better. When I understand your needs better, I'm going to be able to close you better. You're going to see more value from me. And you know what? I'm actually going to close it faster. You see, speed. Sell with speed. Sell with speed. I can't stress that. Especially right now. We're, we're in November. I mean, for most of you, the end of, of the year is the end of December. It is extremely imperative that we sell fast. We've got to make it extremely easy for our customers. Because what I want to say is, or what I want to do is, I just want to get you in the door with something. And then I'll upsell, cross-sell, oversell you, sell you more later on. You see, here's the whole thing. Not all leads are created equal. Now, this comes back to this whole simple piece. We were talk talking about this earlier, that the era of having a single prospecting process is dead. And, and um, Alex with AT&T was, again, talking about you know, inbound and so forth. Now, let me share with you, this is so key, inbound, outbound. It, wow, huge. Hey, this whole thing. Inbound has depreciating value. When, when, when somebody connects with you, they have an itch. You better scratch it. If, if you wait three days to scratch it, that's stalking. Yeah. You, got, you, you, can't, you can't itch it fast enough. So I'm going I'm to have one, process, one process set up for inbound, and I'm going to have another process set up for outbound. Now, I may have four or five different processes, sales prospecting processes, depending on my ICP, depending on the outcomes I, I do. And each one's going to be very unique, very different. Because here's what it comes down to. I've got to meet you where you are. And this comes back to, again, what are the mediums I use? See, here's the whole thing. I find a lot of salespeople say, well, I only, I only like using email. I, man, how many of you have received a stupid prospecting email in the last two, three hours on your phone? I mean, we could sit here and I could read you half a dozen stupid things. And these people just cranking them out, just cranking them out, dumb, dumb, dumb. Because that's all they're comfortable with. See, here's the whole thing. You've got to connect with people on their primary communication method. And their primary communication method is not necessarily your primary communication method. So I'm going to have to use different mediums, different messages, different times. You see, it's all about unlocking as much value as I can. And when I do this, when I unlock all of this value, here's what happens. I'm creating an impact with you. You know what's very interesting? When you do something special for somebody, doesn't that make you feel good? Doesn't it make you feel good? When you complete a sale, doesn't it make you feel good? And, and here's the whole thing. There are many, many times in sales where, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. But you know what? There's always success. There's always success. I want you to end every day always asking yourself, what's the success I had? The success I had may have only been I only connected with two people. That's okay. Celebrate the success. You see, prospecting is an activity. It, well, it's not an activity. It's a lifestyle. And when you do that, it's amazing the impact that you'll have long-term on people. You see, sales leadership is about helping others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. You know what's interesting, though? You make long-term, lasting impact on people. And don't think for a moment that you're not selling. You see, I believe sales is 24-7. You show me a good person who can sell, on the job, and we'll go out to dinner, and you know what? It'll show with how they interact with the wait staff. It'll show how they interact with people. There's a sales DNA. Yeah. I wasn't born with it. Like I said, I fell into it only because of the Seattle Police Department. But what does it do? It allows me to create a lasting impact. Let me share with you a final story about my elementary. How many of you remember your elementary school? This is my elementary school, Lydia Jane Hawk. Lydia Jane Hawk, Lacey Washington. Lacey Washington was this, was this, I don't know, lower middle income school, and it wasn't really worth a whole, but it, 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 it was school. There was a teacher at that school that was really cool. Everybody wanted this teacher. Everybody wanted this teacher. Everybody did. It seemed like everybody had her, but I, but me. She was my mother, <laughs> Mrs. Hunter. Mrs. Hunter taught third grade. She didn't retire until she was 67 years of age from a public school teaching third grade. It was very interesting, but we lived two blocks from school. That meant we walked to school. No, I did not walk to school with my mother, thank goodness. <laughs> she allowed me to walk separately. But what was very interesting was mom every day did her job. Every day did her job. And it was very interesting, after she retired, her health began to slip. And as her health began to slip, oh, wow, it was amazing how people would come over to the house. Again, 
we were, she was iconic in the neighborhood. And it was very interesting, but as her health really began to slip, there was one day that I was over at her house, and my sister was there, and the phone rang, and Bertha said, we really want to come by and see your mom. So we allowed them to come by. And mom's health was really slipping. And a few minutes later, Leroy and his mother are sitting in the living room. And you know how teachers only remember the really good students and the bad students? Well, when we told my mom that Leroy was coming by, you could tell that Leroy was not one of the good students. Okay? You could just tell my mom's treasure. Leroy and his mom sit down, talk, and my mom, being the teacher, starts asking questions. She's just like the salesperson, starts asking Leroy questions. And then, and then the, the, the mother stops and says, hey, you know what? You don't realize the impact that you had on Leroy. You made a huge impact on him. I'm a single mother. Raising three kids, it was a struggle. And Leroy was a handful. But in the third grade, you changed his life around. When he went in the fourth grade, he cried every night for the first several weeks because you weren't his teacher. You made a difference in his life. And she said, as a result of you making a difference in his life, you made a difference in my life because you really don't understand this. But he was the only one of my kids, one, only one of my three kids that I didn't have a problem with in school. In fact, he was the only one of my three kids that graduated from school. He's the only one of my kids that, are not in, that is not in prison today. Stop and think about that for a moment. Did my mom intentionally set out to do that? No. She was just doing her job. She was just doing, see, sales is having the desire to succeed and the passion to serve. That's what you do. I want you to ask yourself this question. Who are the people you're calling on right now who 10, 15 years from now will look back and say, wow, she made a difference in my life. He made a difference in my life. Just as you look back today and, and, and you see people in your life that made an impact on you. We can do that in sales. We do that when we earn the right, the privilege, honor, and respect. You see, it's the C plus C equals C equals O equals P. But it's being willing to take the time to invest in people. That's what my mom was doing. Was my mom doing that intentionally? No, my mom was just trying to get Leroy to the fourth grade. <laughs> but she was making a difference along the way. You see, you make a difference in people far more than you ever realize. Sales leadership is about helping others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. Yeah. Hey, I want you to stay in contact with me because I'm all over the internet. I guess so. And hey, I got eight seconds left on the clock. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark.